is Steffi and welcome back to the Financial Fox Bitcoin series. If we talk about Bitcoin, we must talk about Lightning Network, which is very important for scaling Bitcoin payments. Now, for this episode, I've chosen a very knowledgeable and interesting guest, Christian Catalini. is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at LightSpark, which is building a core infrastructure on the Lightning Network. He's also a co-founder of the MIT Crypto Economics Lab and is a research scientist at MIT. He has got a very interesting background. He was very early into Bitcoin and also he was involved in the Libra project and uh, still the chief economist at DM Association. So he was also involved in the Libra or DM project. So he has seen not only the Bitcoin space, but he was also involved into different digital assets. So I thought it was important to bring his point of view to the table as well. I enjoy my conversation with Christian and I hope that you enjoy as well. And it's going to be valuable to understand a little bit more about the Bitcoin design. Now, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. Hi, Christian. How are you? Hi there. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's uh, really good to have you on the show. So uh, shall we maybe start with one of uh, it for me is a really a very important question and it might give you also the opportunity to talk a little bit about your past and your experience. So when did you discover Bitcoin? I discovered Bitcoin during my PhD at the University of Toronto. So it was probably around 2010, 2011. Wow, you are uh, a we- old we, we were studying the economics of crowdfunding, and so I was quite excited about these new forms for democratizing access to financial services um, and, and new ways to fund ideas and products and, and startups on, online. Uh, I remember you know, bringing it up to my advisor, who at the time said, okay, you should focus on your job market paper, focus on your academic career, uh, you can resume this later, which is what I did. So when I started my job at MIT, in 2013, um, I became involved in the Bitcoin experiment, and that was actually when when I started spending more and more time on Bitcoin and crypto. Okay, so maybe this gives us the opportunity to dive deep into the Bitcoin design because we have done lots of work in cryptocurrency design, like you said. So perhaps, uh, yes, maybe tell us a little bit about the Bitcoin uh, design and perhaps uh, spend some time also to talk about proof of work and how Satoshi managed to build uh, this, uh, can we say next gen- generation of money? Maybe we can. <laughs> so what, what's always puzzling about the Bitcoin design is that no matter how you look at it, it's so simple, but it's also so powerful. Uh, it's really a truly elegant solution. So I think many years into crypto, I think we've seen a lot of different experiments. Uh, but there's something special about Bitcoin, both in the way it was launched and in the way it evolved, that is really unique. It brought together a number of different ideas from different fields. And so it's always fascinating to see the computer scientists get excited about some of the ideas around proof of work. As an economist, when I look at Bitcoin, I find this really elegant solution for achieving global consensus, for agreeing on what the state of a distributed ledger should be. Now, of course, it it has its imperfections. And over time, I think we're seeing efforts in improving some of the limits of Bitcoin. But at its core, it is the one truly native decentralized assets that we have. And what Satoshi brought together is really a really interesting set of academic slash applied ideas uh, that we're still, I think, uncovering uh, the potential of day after day. Do we consider Bitcoin store of value and or currency for payments so you know there is this kind of debate what is the use case of bitcoin what is in your views there are many parts to bitcoin right so over the years i think we've seen bitcoin emerge as a new type of digital asset it's really a new asset class so when you look at it from a financial perspective it's a new object and i think even markets are still exploring and understanding what are the properties of this object when maybe we have global turmoil or countries go through instability in their own currencies. Uh, so that, that part is, I think, is the most well understood. 
But there's a more important element of Bitcoin, which is Bitcoin as a network. Bitcoin as kind of open, interoperable payment rails. Uh, that's the part that we haven't seen so much development yet. Uh, I think a lot more is changing now with Lightning and with what's happening in, in this space. Uh, but that's a really important dimension of Bitcoin. The idea that you can really move value from any point in the globe instantaneously, final settlement in real time, it's quite transformative. We didn't have it before, we do have it with Bitcoin, and I think we're just scratching the surface of what you can do with it. So let's uh, now look at the Lightning Network network you just mentioned it and uh, you know not many of uh, you know may maybe there are some of my viewers they are really not so familiar with Bitcoin and they never use the lightning network as well so I would like to kind of like um, take the opportunity to explain what is the lightning network and how does it work yeah, so the Lightning Network, which is a concept that was actually invented by one of my colleagues, Taj, and has been kind of incubating for a few years in the in the crypto ecosystem, is a way to scale Bitcoin. As we know, Bitcoin has many interesting properties and qualities, uh, but it only can process, you know, a small number of transactions per second. And so if we want to Bitcoin to be more useful for regular payment use cases and global transactions, we really, really need to figure out a way for Bitcoin to scale dramatically. Uh, Lightning is a clever way to scale Bitcoin that doesn't introduce any major compromises. Um, over the years, I think we've seen a lot of experiments around scaling in crypto, but often when you look under the hood, these experiments really change the security and safety assumptions of what you're dealing with. Uh, so you may have a side chain, you have an additional set of validators. There's a new form of trust that is introduced when you're using these other solutions. What is both great and difficult about Lightning is that it is a scaling solution that is Bitcoin through and through. It builds on the safety and security assumptions of Bitcoin, so there's nothing else you need to trust. If you trust Bitcoin today, you will trust Lightning. But at the same time, because of this very constrained set of parameters, it forces you to solve a very hard set of technical, economic, and market design challenges to really get there and scale the network gracefully. So let's uh, uh, t give some example, right? So exactly what you said, we kind of put it in practice. How do I, so I want to pay for coffee. Maybe Bitcoin is not the best way to pay for coffee, but you know, is uh, the Lightning Network a solution or can enable like small transaction and how does it work? Yeah, so the Lightning Network can support everything from tiny, tiny transactions. So think about micropayments for digital content uh, or for any other sort of interaction from tipping to boosting uh, digital uh, interactions online uh, to much larger transactions. So it is a network that has the flexibility to go from the very small to the very large. Uh, of course, that, that requires the right infrastructure. And until now, I think what was lacking in this space is the solution that allow you not only to integrate Lightning, but really use it efficiently. Uh, your example of buying a coffee is one where, of course, because consumers are used to transacting in, in, in their fiat currency, in their local currency, it requires more, more steps uh, to make Lightning truly, truly useful. Uh, so, of course, people will not pay in most countries with Bitcoin anytime soon. And so we need to integrate Lightning with kind of the legacy rails so that we can convert from Bitcoin to fiat and really deliver that transaction in real time, almost magically, sometimes even forgetting that Lightning or Bitcoin is in the picture. I think that's the direction we're traveling towards, which is one where, you know, by combining Lightning and crypto with more traditional on and off ramps and traditional payment rails, we can deliver a new magical experience that is cheaper, faster and more efficient for merchants, businesses and consumers, of course. How Lightning Network allow you to spend your Bitcoin and allow a transaction to happen so quickly so I can just tap on my phone and actually clo and pay for the coffee because Bitcoin transaction they you know they take minutes and minutes before they the next block is uh, mined so I mean how does it work the, the how the Lightning Network works I'm sorry that I keep asking this question but I'm putting it's, an, myself, it's uh, an important in, one in a, and I'm putting myself in the shoes of all my viewers they say oh Lightning Network that's quite cool and Christian is saying some amazing things but I mean, if you have to kind of like bring me back uh, uh, with, a, with a real example or some images, for example, that can help people to understand uh, what is behind it, even if it's in a simplistic way. Yes, I would, the, the best way to think about Lightning is to think about, you know, channels. 
Yes. So channels are essentially connections between two counterparties. And you could imagine a channel between a merchant and a consumer uh, or between two different financial entities on the network. You establish these channels beforehand and you put some Bitcoin liquidity in those channels. What that then allows you to do is to move payments back and forth within that channel instantaneously in real time. So while the Bitcoin is not really moving on layer one, which as we know is slow, it can move really fast on this kind of highway that you're building on top of it. Now, of course, uh, that sounds easier said than done because how, how do you establish the right channels? How do you build the right connections? And more important, how do you ensure that that Bitcoin is ready to be moved in the right place when you need it? Uh, you, you kind of have to do all this pre preparatory work um, to make the network actually work. It, it looks a little bit like correspondent banking where you have relationship between all these parties and you can move value through them, essentially point to point anywhere on the globe, but you do have to solve a very complicated problem around liquidity. And that's something that, for example, at LightSpark, we've been focused from day one, really ensuring that as you build these channels, as you build the roads for Bitcoin to travel, as you're making sure that those roads have drivers ready to move your payments, say from A to B and carry you where you need to go, everything is in place, everything is set up for, for that payment to feel instantaneous, even if there was a lot of work behind the scenes, to prepare for that special moment where you're trying to pay, you know, merchant, uh, an online website or something else. Okay, brilliant. So tell me more about what you're doing with LightSpark and how your work can actually add value in scaling the lightning ecosystem. A big realization we had uh, when we founded LightSpark was that, you know, the world still needs an open protocol for money, for moving value from anywhere to anywhere else. Um, and, and unfortunately, when you look at the landscape, even in crypto, uh, most projects and protocol have struggled to really build a truly open and available and interoperable protocol. Lightning is an ideal candidate for that. First of all, because it's based on Bitcoin, right? So the most decentralized, secure, battle-tested, both from a governance and technical perspective network that we have. But Lightning, again, is challenging. It's very difficult to make Lightning work out of the box. And in fact, you know, many people that were enthusiastic about Lightning in the early days when it was proposed, tested it, tried it out. They felt it was way too much work to make Lightning efficient and they kind of gave up. So when we came in, uh, we started looking at all the technical challenges that were, uh, you know, limiting really Lightning adoption and also economic challenges like the issues around liquidity that I was hinting at uh, a few a few seconds ago. We built what we believe is the first kind of enterprise grade reliable solution uh, for solving those problems. And the way we do it is twofold. First of all, we make it extremely easy for you to connect to the Lightning Network. Uh, so it, it's almost like using a traditional payment provider. You have a set of simple APIs. You can integrate Lightning into any wallet, any crypto exchange, any digital fintech product, any digital platform. Uh, that shouldn't take you know days and days of work. It should be hours. Uh, so that that's kind of the first challenge that we solved. The second one, we need to ensure that Lightning always delivers high success rates. When people pay for something online or offline, they expect a seamless experience. These days we tap with, with our cards or our phones and within seconds that payment is successfully executed. That was not the state of affairs when we started working on Lightning. In fact, success rates were very, very low. Uh, you know, in the order of 50 to 60%. So we were almost like flipping a coin and hoping for that payment to succeed. The reason was, was kind of the hidden complexity of liquidity and ensuring that you know, when you're trying to move Bitcoin, there's already a set of channels in place so that that Bitcoin can travel really quickly where it needs to go. Uh, so that's the other problem that we tackled with, with LightSpark, which was essentially we need to make sure that liquidity is where it's needed when it is needed. It's, it's a prediction problem. What's interesting about prediction problems these days is that AI is a great tool for the job. Whenever you can rephrase a problem into a prediction problem, uh, then we can use these wonderful new models and, and, and kind of target them uh, with a very good solution. So now not only you're getting uh, low, low failure rates uh, and high, high success rates, but you're also getting low latency, right? So the kind of low latencies that consumers have come to expect from, from modern payment experiences. And all of that also comes with high capital efficiency. One of the problems and, and early solutions to Lightning would require these participants to lock, you know, tens if not hundreds of Bitcoins in channels. But 
capital that is locked in idle is extremely expensive. So if we want the Lightning to really scale and compete with existing payment networks, we need to move those Bitcoins really quickly through the network. And we need to always make sure that when a consumer or a business is trying to move value, those Bitcoins are available for that transaction to succeed. So if, uh, let's say, I'm, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go and buy a coffee, right? And I have got a Bitcoin wallet right how do i pay using lightning so if the merchant is integrated with you know a payment service provider or someone else that supports lightning that transaction could go even today imagine from the cash app which is an app that already incorporates lightning but there's going to be many more in the near future from that wallet directly to the merchant instantaneously and, and and by the way it's kind of magic it's final settlement the merchant has the money right away yeah. uh, it happens in an instant and it doesn't require many of the steps that we see in traditional payment rails and i guess the wallet i'm using should support lightning should support the lightning network correct correct and that's why we're working on really lowering the friction for anyone to add lightning uh, to the set of tools that they use for accepting payments as we lower frictions for people to incorporate lightning and also as we make it easier for people to convert from bitcoin to to dollars say for example euros suddenly the tool becomes an awful lot more useful for everyone uh, because of course a merchant most of the time will need to pay their bills we need to pay their employees so they will likely need uh, fiat not not Bitcoin okay so if we have to kind of recap the key challenges of uh, scaling Bitcoin as a network so scaling lightning basically uh, what would you say you mentioned liquidity which so we have technical challenges right so we need to make lightning extremely reliable and easy to use yeah. we have economic challenges we need to make sure that liquidity is well deployed and is readily available and and last I think we also need to to work on the ecosystem and the market that's why for example we launched the wallet SDK the wallet SDK is one example of really lowering friction lowering barriers for anyone that has an idea whether it's a developer a startup or an established enterprise to integrate lightning in an existing product once you introduce that everyone can become an endpoint so it's not just banks neo banks or new players and digital wallets it could be a large creator economy platform or a marketplace or a ride sharing uh, ecosystem all of these can suddenly enable new types of payments from you know small payments micro payments to even streaming money um, one example you know when you think about our salaries these days they're typically paid every two weeks or every month uh, but for many good reasons I mean employees would benefit from kind of a more regular streaming of their salary in real time that would allow them for example to you know uh, pay their bills more regularly and not worry about coming to the end of the month uh, lightning enables those, all these new use cases around payments and so I think we're just at the beginning uh, of a payment renaissance on, on top of Bitcoin and lightning yeah, definitely. And uh, I mean, t talking about businesses, right? Uh, maybe many people listening to this show, they are, they've got small businesses, some maybe they've got big businesses, but what will be the benefit of uh, having Bitcoin as uh, um, a mean of transaction using lightning for example so why they should embrace uh, this innovation or they should pioneer it within their industry i would say the important one the starting point is always going to be lower cost and lightning can deliver substantially lower cost than the existing alternatives the other important one is instantaneous settlement uh, merchant especially as we've seen uh, during covid uh, often struggle with cash flow and so even those 30 45 days uh you know in, in getting that payment actually in your bank account for some of these transactions can be extremely extremely important when you enable lightning you can get paid in real time as you perform the work or you deliver the services and goods to consumers directly uh, so it really changes the economics of payments and and more broadly for those that want to build new types of products and experiences you can unlock value in novel ways uh, for example a creator that is trying to monetize their digital work could do a live streaming and get paid in real time as they perform the live streaming online for an audience or you could create digital content where it's journalism music or media and unlock that content without friction online or get tipped uh, for certain uh, you know content and actions and participation on these platforms instantaneously with final settlement again I want to stress the final settlement because we're not really used to it in in society right so for, for consumers the moment we pay we feel like okay the transaction is done but often for the other side whether it's a creator a platform a merchant that money doesn't get and is not available to them right away 
or if they want it right available to them, uh, they often have to pay 1% or more uh, just for the, for, for, for the right uh, to access their own money. It's funny because you are actually stressing on a very interesting point. If I go and buy something, the money leave my account straight away. But yes. the other side doesn't have the money straight away. So there is this limbo where the money travel and every, some, you know, some party they get fees and that's kind of all the, um, uh, the problem actually the, the, of the current system is all this uh, limbo where you don't know where the, where the money are and, uh, and some party getting paid uh, as you know, this third party getting paid. That's probably, and that's really what Bitcoin is trying to solve and what crypto is bringing a solution now you just touch the point i mean we discuss about payments and you know all the benefit but we also want to talk about one aspect uh, one topic that has uh, uh, created lots of controversy which is the energy that bitcoin consume so what is your argument on the consumption of uh, energy consumption of bitcoin and also are we going to find the solution to make uh, you know transaction in bitcoin less expensive and you know greener if we want to use this term yes the energy issue is a complex one and it really takes you know actually a lot of research and understanding of all the ecosystem participants to uncover what is actually going on uh, so often i think what you find online is pretty superficial i would say that when it comes to bitcoin and energy uh, technologies such as lightning are extremely promising uh, because with the same amount of proof of work with the same amount of of, of mining and energy being consumed uh, you can now support you know millions of transactions and not billions of transactions and users at the same time so one part of the equation is by scaling lightning we're making that energy that's being used on layer one a lot more useful to society and, and I think that's going to be a really important component. But as an economist, I, I like to look at some of these trends more in, in kind of in the long run. And we, we should ask the question of like, what does Bitcoin as a network look at scale in equilibrium? We're far from that, right? So it's still the word of early adopters, people that want to hold Bitcoin because they believe it's a new type of asset. Maybe they transact with it in some countries uh, because, again, they have an unstable currency. So Bitcoin becomes an interesting alternative to, to their local fiat. Uh, but it's pretty niche, right? We haven't gotten to, to mainstream applications and use cases. As those actually emerge, uh, something quite interesting is that the economic forces behind energy production in Bitcoin are actually driving miners to find sources of energy that nobody else can use. And the intuition behind this is that Bitcoin can use energy that it's usually stranded, right? It could be in a remote place. Uh, it could be very hard to consume or store. And battery technology, of course, as we know, is expensive. Even when we think about EV, there's a whole set of questions around, will we be able to extract as much lithium to support that battery technology? Bitcoin in those regions, in those stra stranded places where often you have lots of renewables, whether it's solar, wind, or uh, flare gas uh, that can be repurposed for, for mining, uh, that energy can now be captured and put good to good use uh, around, around Bitcoin. And so if you zoom out, actually what's already happening, and of course it's early days, but I think we're going to see more of this, renewables and energy that is in, in, in random places that cannot be used or that is, is kind of otherwise wasted. So think about peak consumption and when you know we have too much energy on the grid and there's too little consumption. Bitcoin is, is almost like a great buffer for all of that. We've son, seen some of that in Texas where some of Bitcoin miners have already coordinated with grid and utilities to essentially absorb energy when there's excessive energy and then turn off their facilities and not mine when there's there's a need uh, by consumers and, and, and businesses but in the long run what's going to likely happen is not only that Bitcoin is going to be a catalyst for renewables and I think you'll see eventually municipalities that will use Bitcoin as a way to subsidize their transition to renewables uh, but more broadly Bitcoin will become almost this magic battery that we have in different places of the world that can absorb energy that we would otherwise you know literally waste use it store it in in, in the form of digital coins and then, you know, can be repurposed in the form of security for supporting things like payments, financial applications and a lot more for society. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of interesting things happening on, uh, you know, the energy, the energy aspect. I completely agree with you. Now, uh, I want to move a little bit on, uh, uh, I mean, to your work with MIT, because you are the founder of the MIT Crypto Economic Labs, economic, Economics Lab. And uh, yeah, so I would like to understand uh, how that started, 
right? And also how difficult was, or if it was any difficult, to kind of get MIT to take uh, crypto seriously, and what was uh, their approach to, um, yeah, to, to, to Bitcoin and crypto at, at the very early stage? Yeah, so we would have to go back to 2013, which is when we designed the MIT Bitcoin experiment. Uh, some of you may remember back in the day, we dropped something like half a million dollars in, in, in Bitcoin. Uh, don't even ask what, what the value of that is today to all MIT undergraduate students. And the idea to I'm the re- now. <laughs> And the idea was to design a research study and understand how are our students thinking about this? What are they building? What kind of decisions are they making in terms of wallets, privacy, and, and so on and so forth? All sort of challenges that I think we've, play, we've seen play out in crypto over the following years. I must say, actually, the administration was, was pretty supportive of, of that experiment, especially after we went through all the motions to make the, the study safe and really think through, you know, how do we make this a learning experience and something that, that we can learn from? But I, I think you're right. I mean, in the academic circle, crypto in 2013 was was considered like a, a really odd object uh, and in fact most of my colleagues I remember back in the day were still very confused of why you know why would I spend time on this the crypto economics lab was early in in this space and and part of the job was both digesting some of the content and, and producing rigorous research on the topic but also informing informing policymakers and regulators uh, it was early days and of course as you can imagine often there was a lot of confusion around the dangers of the technology in the early days you know even when we did the experiment, I remember we interacting with Treasury uh, and, and a number of other uh, three-letter agencies around their concerns about us distributing Bitcoin because at the time it was perceived mostly as, as a vehicle for financial crime. Uh, so we've come a long way, uh, but I think there's still a lot of work to be done in really clarifying what is the potential of the technology, how can it help bring more competition uh, to sectors of the economy from financial services to digital platforms that haven't seen as much competition over the last few years. Uh, and academia, of course, can play an important role in, in gi- really giving you an honest analysis of the trade-offs. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What is the risk what, that we're missing if we don't invest in this technology, you know, as if we had abandoned the internet in the early days uh, of the 90s? Definitely, academia is very important. And for some uh, aspect, really, is more teaching uh, the old generation and the traditional, you know, the traditional industry rather than the new generation, which might be more open and more accustomed actually to crypto. So uh, talking about the work that you have done through your research uh, tr- uh, with the um, uh, governmental agency, uh, I would like to, to know how difficult still is to deal with them and do you think the solution is really more education or should be more uh, experimentation and perhaps uh, yeah just uh, just getting I don't want to say getting new people there I mean I should actually say getting new people there I mean we need to kind of uh, get crypto and bitcoin on boarded how can we achieve that I think there's actually quite an understanding in different agencies both in the US and abroad of crypto, what the technology can do, wh- what some of its potential is. I, I, I think in the in the last few months and probably over, over the last year or so, crypto has a very bad reputation because of the events we've seen in 2022. And so I, I think the obstacle that the industry needs to, to really, the obstacle that needs to be overcome is how do we convey and make it really salient that the technology can, can do good and can solve for use cases that both consumers and businesses care about. Uh, after all, I think, you know, what, what happened in 2022, we've seen some some major failures. We've seen cases of fraud, and that has reinforced this opinion of crypto just being a speculative technology, of something that is it's only good for investment, that has attracted a number of bad actors. Uh, but we we kind of lost the plot on how do we really deliver utility and value to consumers in a way that regulators and policymakers can see. Okay, this this is what people have been talking about for a long time. We we don't have those examples at scale today, and I think that that's probably the main obstacle to getting better regulation to get it, getting uh, more support for the industry, je- not only here, but also abroad. But also making a clear separation between Bitcoin, what Bitcoin has created, and also the other crypto things, uh, the noise, uh, the speculation. And uh, I think that's also a very important aspect because, I mean, and, and I want to ask this question to you as well. So the central banks, they own gold on their reserves, right? They own in their treasury, sorry. And uh, if Bitcoin is a better version of gold or is the new gold do you think at some point they are going to have 
Bitcoin in their treasury as well? I think that's potentially inevitable. I mean, the, the role of Bitcoin as a new asset class um, may lead to that direction. Of course, there's going to be a different pace between different countries. And when that becomes feasible or viable, Bitcoin needs to show a lot more utility before that happens for sure. But it is really interesting that suddenly we have a technology that can really serve as a global ledger uh, for transactions uh, that didn't exist before. And so even if you forget Bitcoin, the asset, I think one of the reasons why you'll see more integration eventually, you know, five, 10 years from now between what central banks do and networks like Bitcoin is going to be because of Bitcoin, the network, Bitcoin, the, the payment infrastructure that can really connect anyone on the globe without borders, without barriers. And uh, if we look at um, other crypto and uh, perhaps broadly digital assets, because you have been the co-creator of DM, formerly Libra, uh, chief economist as well as the DM Association. So what is, um, what would you say, or how do you say Bitcoin is different from digital assets, from the other digital assets that, you know, we have got? today and they are still developing. Look, what we tried to do with DM and Libra, right, was launch an open protocol for money that was interoperable and available to everyone on the globe. Uh, one of the challenges we incurred is that because we were also the developers and, and, and one of the key stakeholders initially of this new ecosystem, uh, w when people look at that, and this applies to, I think, many of the tokens, if not all of the other tokens that are not Bitcoin, it becomes challenging to motivate why should we trust this network over, over an alternative, right? You often have a central actor, a startup, a team, someone that, that is kind of behind that protocol. And in the case of Libra Diem, of course, even if we created a de decentralized organization with you know multiple members or with one vote, it was always very difficult for people to trust that form of distributed governance. With Bitcoin, you have none of those problems. The network is already decentralized. It's been running for years. There's no you know coordinator around that. Even the developers that are kind of building and improving Bitcoin have to achieve consensus. And it's often kind of a long process process that requires multiple stakeholders. We do have essentially an example of live decentralized governance in action with Bitcoin. And that's extremely useful if you're trying to build payments, uh, because everyone knows that, sure, they could build with LightSpark and integrate Lightning through us, but they could use a different provider. It's an open network. You can switch between different options. You're really free to connect on your own term. And when you do that, it really changes the dynamics of, of the game substantially. So, you know, right now when we're building on Lightning, we're just part of a much broader ecosystem. Everybody can kind of improve the ecosystem and everybody can work with each other with different solutions. It's a bit like the internet, right? So one of the things that made the internet very successful over, say, a closed version of the internet that some players, by the way, in the early days of the internet tried to do, right? More curated versions of the internet that were within their own silo is that it allows you to connect in many different forms and shapes. Lightning is like that. And so for us, the, the major realization in transitioning in a way, once we dropped the towel with Libra Diem to building on Bitcoin was like, well, you know, if you look at the crypto landscape, there's one network that has all the right properties and it is Bitcoin. Yeah. Exactly. Right. What uh, are your thoughts on all the experimentation that is happening on Bitcoin? You know, ordinals, BSC20, I mean, let's name it, right? And today I actually learned that the first decentralized identity was built on Bitcoin, uh, which was quite interesting. So, yeah, is Bitcoin uh, going too far with all the experimentation or the experimentation is actually good, even if the fees are rising, but uh, it could uh, actually be good for uh, the Bitcoin network to actually improve, perhaps? So, first of all, experimentation on Bitcoin, it's, it's extremely good, right? To me, it feels almost like, again, when I looked at Bitcoin in 2013, I think there was a lot of promise around Bitcoin democratizing access to payments, financial services. And then somehow, I think we lost the plot. Uh, we went into almost a decade of, of token launches. Uh, and I think the economics of that were, were driving the motivation behind it, right? So if you could launch a token and uh, overnight look like you created a network worth billions of dollars, then a lot of talent went into that direction. Uh, that also caused problems with regulators and some of these tokens of course, are, are now at risk of being labeled securities. But if you go back to where we started, what we were trying to do in the space, I think, and many, many participants were excited about was like using crypto as open rails for new products and services. And for that, you, you kind of can start back from Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, is already available as a network. It has massive network effects and liquidity globally. It has the most regulatory clarity in the most countries. And so I think
think what you're seeing is almost like people looking back and saying, well, maybe the answer was, was kind of under our nose this entire time. We should build on Bitcoin. And so now you're seeing people building things like Noster. Uh, so kind of social media meets Bitcoin and tipping, uh, which are kind of really new forms for creators to monetize uh, what, what they do every day. You're seeing ordinals, so non-fungible tokens coming onto Bitcoin. And then you're seeing projects that often are started almost as a joke, like BRC20, driving all sort of innovation in, in the ecosystem. So I think this is all great. And to some extent, when Bitcoin faces pressures to scale, that will only accelerate more bright minds coming into Bitcoin and figuring out how to help Bitcoin scale and work around some of the technical limitations. Lightning is, of course, a big piece of that. But more broadly, I think you'll see more of crypto really retreat to a number of core networks. And, and again, the, the many, many tokens that were launched, I think most of those uh, will, won't be able to make as much progress, both because of regulatory uncertainty, but also because when you think about their the reason of existence, often, often there isn't one. So if we look at regulation, what is your views on actually how regulation of Bitcoin and crypto should uh, take place? Do you have some kind of ideas, proposal, or you just want to make some comment, perhaps? It's complex, right? Because when you when you say crypto, there's many different areas of crypto, and they will likely need tailored solutions. Uh, you know, for example, stable coins. We we, we spent many years uh, designing and refining ideas on uh, will need proper regulation in the United States and in other regions. Now, Europe with Mica is already kind of making a first step in that direction and around digital assets as, as a newer framework. Uh, other countries like the UK may follow. But, but in many regions, we don't have really regulatory clarity uh, on things that stay at the interface between traditional payments and, and crypto like stable coins. Uh, similarly, I think we'll need a framework for, for these many tokens. The good news with Bitcoin is that because it's not a security, uh, I mean, it's the one asset that even in the, in the US framework, it's very clearly a, a commodity. You don't have that concern. But as, as the space develops, I think we will need a framework for tokens that are not Bitcoin and, and how they really fit into the existing uh, regulatory lens. Um, there's also important questions around compliance, anti-money laundering. How do we ensure that these networks as they scale and thrive really meets some of the, the safety and protections that we come to expect from, from payments in the traditional financial system? But those are kind of three building blocks and I think we'll see them develop over time. The reason why we're excited to focus on Bitcoin is because, again, it's the one asset with regulatory clarity. It's the one asset where if you look at neobanks, financial institutions around the globe, it's the first asset that they're comfortable using uh, as, as they venture away from TradFi and into, uh, you know, crypto. Uh, and so it becomes a natural bridge between the old and the new. A bridge that can be very constructive, right? It's not just about crypto competing with these established institutions, but also enabling new functionality and lowering costs for their customers and businesses. I'm always thinking like the po policymaker, they need um, a very, con uh, they need a continuous dialogue with the industry. And if the industry decide to use a specific technology that perhaps could be, you know, lightning network, um, that, then there should be th this continuous dialogue so the industry and those founders can explain why and with use cases and with proof can actually get the regulators and the policymaker on board. I really think this kind of lobbying from the industry is really, really important and is essential for regulation to go in the right direction to foster innovation. Otherwise, we are going to get stuck a little bit. You know, we need to kind of like work together on that. Now, on uh, the last point, because you mentioned it before, and I'm very interested, and perhaps, you know, you have got also a way that, you know, that is going to be incorporated into LightSpark. Tell me about AI. So how AI can help crypto to, in, can bring crypto in the right direction or can help crypto, can support crypto, that's the right word, can support crypto to, to flourish? The two technologies are actually complements in many applications. So using the two together, delivers a stronger solution than either one uh, in separation, right? And one example uh, is the one we're already building on at LightSpark, which is to make Bitcoin really capital efficient, you have to be able to develop these advanced models uh, that can do prediction really well. So that liquidity is, again, only there when it's needed and, and it's not parked idle on the network. So that, that's a specific example that we've been spending a lot of time on. Uh, but more broadly, uh, when you think about what's unique about crypto, and we're seeing experiments around identity, for example, on this. Um, with more AI, uh, we need to be able to uh, assess provenance or authenticity or identity. And so you, you really see how the technology is where, where crypto makes things expensive and difficult to 
to, to cheat, and AI can make them extremely scalable, the two together can deliver you a better solution. So if I were to guess, in the future, when people consume AI models, we would likely be paying through crypto rails, because those rails are a lot more efficient for interacting with these models. Uh, but more important, as content is generated, the authenticity of that content, the identity of the people behind that content may be proven using crypto. Uh, again, it's early days, uh, but these are definitely the two technologies that are, that are going to be working in tandem in the near future. Christian, thank you so much for highlighting that. I think it's a great point. And uh, thank you for coming on the show. Now, before you go, if anybody is interested to check out uh, LightSpark, where should they go? LightSpark.com. Okay. And if they want to reach out to you or, you know, to... Uh, Twitter is the best place or where Twitter is a great place. Yes, please, please connect with us. We're always looking for feedback as we launch new features and ideas and products. Um, again, we're doing this in, in tandem and we work with the community. So yeah, thank you. Exactly. Feedback is always very important. Okay, Christian, thank you so much for coming on and uh, sharing your insight with us. Thank you for your questions. It was a pleasure.